Hey everyone, uh, welcome to my talk, Futures Concurrency in the Future. Wait, big screen, I can see myself. Okay, that, that's gone. Um, f- futures Concurrency in the Future, maybe, kind of, uh, Rustlins, hey. Uh, so yeah, I'm Yash. Uh, I work as a Rust developer advocate at Microsoft as my day job. So, you know, in case you don't know what Microsoft is, uh, Microsoft. Um, yeah, so... Um, I've got cats. Uh, that's very important. This is Chashu. Uh, she was eating from my hand up until like just now. There's a treat here, but she's like no longer interested. So maybe she'll make an appearance later. And this is Nori uh, sitting in a box. Um, yeah. <laughs> and th- this was them together in our last apartment uh, doing what they do best, which is asking for food that they're not allowed to have and then look very cute. So yeah, that's... Oh. Oh, oh, double slide. Oh, what else did I do? Yes, uh, maybe you know me like, what, what might you know me from? Uh, I helped create Async Stud once upon a time. Uh, I am currently part of the Async Foundation's working group. It's a Rust working group uh, responsible for making async await things happen in the standard lib and the language. Um, so yeah. Um, why this talk? Like, what 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 are we talking about today? What what's the broader theme here? So um, we are talking about futures and async and Rust because it, it started in twenty fifteen or maybe two thousand eight. Kind of depends on where you where you start, how you start counting. Um, but stood future today in the standard lib kind of looks like this. Uh, there's like a couple of traits and like three functions and like barely any description, so it's not much. We're trying to expand on that. Um, you know, like the, the future trade itself only has like a single method. And, you know, what we really want to do is we, we want to expand on, on these traits. We want to build them out. We want to make it a richer experience, move past an MVP stage. So in this talk, uh, what we'll be cover, covering is like um, how like possible designs and considerations around those designs for async concurrency adapters that we could potentially add to a standard lib. So that's that's the broader theme and we'll we'll dive into details um, more specifically for that. So um, what we'll be covering in this talk is first we'll be looking at terminology, then we'll be looking at the various modes of concurrency, um, establish a little bit of like theoretical background stuff there, I guess. Uh, whoop. <laughs> API design comes next. Um, then we'll be looking at uh, merging streams, which is another kind of concurrency, not quite futures, but a little bit different. And finally, looking ahead. Yeah. So starting off, terminology. Hey, we all love terminology. So this this future is intended to be like uh, I don't expect you to like be on the Lang team or anything, so I'm I'm trying to the, like start from the start. Um, so if you already know these things, then yeah, just bear with me. Uh, so parallelism and concurrency, like they're different. Um, and like bleh, bleh, bleh. Um, what parallelism is, you, you you might like sometimes like hear them like used interchangeably, but they're they're separate things really. Like the the way I like to think about parallelism is as a resource. Like any computer will have a set amount of parallelism that it can like give, um, right? Like usually people refer to it as like the the hardware threads in your computer, but sometimes it's like locked down through software, like container or whatever. It may have like fewer threads available, less parallelism available than like what what the underlying hardware exposes. So it's it's just a resource, and it's it's usually like a max, like a minimum of one, maximum of however much your computer can expose, right? So you, using multiple cores on a machine is like a typical example of parallelism in action. Multiple cores work at the same time and do stuff at the same time, right? The, the way you can measure parallelism using Rust is you use the num CPU crate and you like call it and it gives you back like a number. And that that's that's the resource usually. Now, um, we, we we won't be talking about that today. So concurrency, not parallelism. So all the, all the multi-core stuff, not really in the picture for today. Um, instead, we'll be talking about concurrency, which is a system structuring mechanism. I, I lifted this from literature, by the way. Um, so, you know, in Node.js uh, is famously single thread, like single threaded uh, JavaScript runtime, multiple threads behind it, but but the actual thing you execute on is single threaded, but still async. Um, that is because async programming does not require multiple threads. It's because concurrency does not require multiple threads. You, you can structure a program in such a way that you just use one thread, but you still have stuff going on 
um, executing concurrently, right? So they're they're not the same thing. Um, yeah. So let's give a practical example, or well, not quite. <laughs> so what, what's the future? A future is an asynchronous value. Um, the way you can think about it, it is a value that you know will only become a value after you call dot await on it. There's some magic on the, under the hood going on. I, I don't want to dig too deep into that, but here's like a practical example. Say we have like let num equals ten. Uh, we're defining a variable here of name num, uh, which has a value of ten, right? Here's the async version of that, where we have a future that will resolve to the value 10. And when we await it, it resolves to that value. And then we can assign that to a variable binding, right? This is the same thing of writing like what we had here. Instead of like creating an anonymous future using the async keyword, we can manually create it using like ready. This is also the same, the same exact result. Um, but yeah, wh whenever you see this, you can just think that, you know, instead of like resolving to a number, we could be doing something more interesting, like reading a file uh, asynchronously. Whoops, <laughs> I swapped the question mark and you wait there. But, you know, you, you, you get the idea, hopefully. Um, yes. So yeah, let num async 10, it, it's a placeholder for doing more interesting things like reading files or doing like network requests or stuff like that. All right. So yeah, while a future resolves, we can do other stuff concurrently is the main takeaway of like what a future is. So let's take a look at um, the hello world of um, concurrency. So like a, a quick little join here, right? So we uh, have like one. Um, so starting off, like let's, let's do some stuff like sequentially. Let's define like a future A, which resolves to 10. Uh, we delay it for like one second. The delay is part of async std. I don't know if other runtimes have it, right? We say like, hey, this resolves to number 10 after waiting for one second, right? B, the number 11, also wait one second. And then we await A, which, you know, resolves to 10. Then we await B, which resolves to 11. And that took two seconds, right? One second for one, another second for a second, total time elapsed, two seconds, right? So what if we did that concurrently? You know, we could do a dot join b, and then await that, and then we get a tuple back. And now what we're doing is while a is not doing anything, right? While it's like sleeping, and the, we we get back to it later, we can kick off like the the execution of future b, which also waits for a while. And then once both are resolved, we get the result of both back. And now how long this took is just one second, right? One second, one second, but they happen, they're waiting at the same time. So we don't wait. Like in real time, this actually reduces the real time. Even though not multiple cores are involved, it's still concurrent. So it reduces real time execution. And we're we're not waiting around for stuff uh, instead. All right? Yay, concurrency. Yay. <laughs> so hopefully that that sort of sets you in the mindset of like how how concurrency is kind of used. All right. First act, uh, modes of concurrency. Here, here we get a little bit techy. Um, first off, infallible concurrency. So what's infallible? Uh, basically a future which does not return a result. That's what we mean by infallible here, right? So we wait for all inputs. Uh, the, the two modes of like infallible like concurrency is like wait for all inputs or wait for the first input, right? Future join was wait for all inputs. We give it like a set of inputs, then we wait for all of the inputs to resolve and we'll get a set of outputs back, right? Of resolved futures. Um, and then there's like wait for first output. So the way that happens is here's our like uh, join example, which is like one delay right now of four seconds, right? Um, instead using a race, we can rewrite it like this and we say a.raceb, dot wait, and that resolves to 11. So what happens here is we have two futures of the same type, and we try and get uh, the future, or we get the future which resolves first. So uh, future A takes four seconds to resolve. Future B resolves instantly, which means we get the value of future B, which in this case is eleven, and we discard future A. Um, this is useful when, say, you have um, a file system call like that you're like getting something from cache, but maybe you also have a request going on. You're like, oh, just give me whichever one like resolves first. Um, I believe Firefox used to do this or still does. And sometimes like networks faster, but sometimes, you know, on very fast uh, hard drives, uh, 
uh, hard drive is faster. So it kind of does both and says, give me, give me the first result. Um, that, that's what racing does. So yeah, wait for first output. Now, um, if we introduce uh, results like fa fallibility into the mix, uh, things become a bit more interesting. So fallibility is when, or like something's fallible when it returns a result. So in this case, a future of a result. Uh, these are like effect systems. You need to like figure it out or like know, know too much about it, but you know, it creates like a fun little matrix. So fallible, we, we still have the first two, which is like wait for all outputs, wait for first output. That's like one axis. And then there is also, um, do we continue on error or do we return early on error? Right? So we can plot them out like this in a little table. And then, uh, you know, our join example, we can fill in there, which is we wait for all outputs and then we continue on error. So if an error occurs, we, we just keep on going. Uh, now here we have our race, right? Um, here uh, we can put that in future race, uh, which waits for the first output. Um, and if an error occurs, uh, we actually do return early. It's kind of like counterintuitive that like sits on the bottom right corner, but it's, it's not aware of like what result does. So an error occurs, it says, oh, cool, I got the first value. If it was an error, it's an error, right? So we return early. Now, what if we, oh, here, yeah, what if we like start using different ones, right? What, what if we wanted to target the other one? So in async std, we have a method called try join, uh, which does that. Oh, an alarm's going off outside, um, right? Which can do uh, a.tryjoin b, uh, both like okay. And then here we uh, get back 10, 11, because both values are okay. Um, but if we switch it up and we get like a okay and an error uh, future, right, then this will resolve and will like return early. Uh, it will short circuit and resolve to the error value, right? So we can put that there. This returns early on error, but we'll still will try and wait for all outputs like otherwise, right? So if, if the values are all okay, you get all the values. If one of them errors, it drops all the futures and it just gives you back the error. Um, now in the, bot, in the top right corner, a dot race, we can replace that with like uh, a dot try race, right? We await that, and here, you know, in in the case of okay, we just get back okay. But if we convert this to error, um, then we get back yeah. Uh, we still ah, <laughs> you know, the the first future to resolve is future B, but we get back the value of future A. It looks at future B. It says, oh wait, that is an error. Uh, let me not return early quite yet. Um, let me try and like wait for future A to come back. And then it says like, okay, 10. The name try race is kind of like not great here and we need to work on that. But you know, um, yeah, we can fill that into, into the chart like this. So uh, if we rewrite this and we both have errors, then you know, the output of this is it's an error, right? It will try and keep going and try and get like a single value and like race values up until it has no more values to like resolve. Uh, and if there's an error, it, it will like retry. Um, that's what that does. Uh, yay, that's good. Oh. Uh, bu -bu -bu -bu. Okay, so uh, yeah, you know, that, that's our little overview. Um, other languages have concurrency methods as well. Um, JavaScript or Node.js, uh, you can plot the, the promise methods out kind of like this. Promise all settled goes there. Promise race goes there. Promise all there and promise any in the top right corner. And, and these do the same thing. Uh, these are all like added or like stabilized late last year is when they, when they all became available. So now we have like a sort of like framework of like the various concurrency modes. Um, we can dig into API design. Like I briefly mentioned, uh, some of these things are already like available in libraries, in async std, for example, but also futures RS, and I believe Tokyo probably also has something, you know. But but you know, we're we're trying to like figure out um, ways to like stabilize this in the standard lib. And reason of this talk is I I think we can do better with API design. So let's let's dig into into the exact APIs here for a sec, right? So we have a two-way join. I'll, I'll use join for as the example, but it kind of applies to all the all the combinators here. So two-way join looks like this. Future A B, we join it, we get a tuple back, right? So the return type of that is join uh, T1, T2 for like a tuple. Because tu tuples can contain like uh, different values, uh, values of different types, right? 
So it, you need to represent that like in the tuple. So a three-way join um, looks like this. So we start off with our two-way join. Uh, then we create, oh, no, <laughs> very fancy. We split it off into like its own future. It doesn't matter, right? But we create, uh, we create a third future, resolves to the number 12. We join that. And then this becomes uh, a nested tuple. So we get um, open bracket, a tuple of 10, 11, close, and then like on the right hand side, number 12. You would probably expect like 10, 11, 12, but it becomes like nested, right? That's not good. Uh, it's kind of like annoying to work with. So what, yeah, that's the return type. It's it's because we're like nesting join um, futures, right? So a, a four-way join, you can probably expect it now, but you know, uh, we add a, a future D and we get back, you know, a, a three level nested like tuple. That's, you know, you, you, you can imagine as we like start to like nest more and more, things become worse and worse, right? So the, the way this is um, solved in uh, many of the libraries is by having a join macro, which uses an async block and this code gen based on the input to then return a flat tuple of, of the output types. And the return type of this is generated by the by the compiler at compile time, essentially, using the async block. Yay! So um, n way join, right? A question here that we need to consider is like, is n const? Where const means does the compiler know the length at compile time? Can quite fit into a bullet point. So yeah, but yeah, do do we know the length of um, the type or the size of the type at compile time, right? So here, uh, if we don't, like what we can do is we can like create two futures, put them inside of a vec, and keep adding futures to a vec. Vecs can grow as long as you like, as long as you don't like run out of memory. You you can just put them in there. You don't need to know upfront how long a vec will be. That's its nice quality, right? And then we can call something to join it, and then we await that, and we get a vec back. And the method in futures uh, for that non async state, we don't have this, uh, is join all. So you know, that's a different import. You need to be aware of it. So you need to use futures, future, join all for this. Whereas um, for the join macro, I'll use it. You, for example, use async std future join. These are all like slightly like different ways to get there and you like need to remember them, which is not great. And like, there's like different calling conventions. Oh, whoa, yeah. Like one uses uh, like, you know, there are different import paths. One uses like is like a macro invocation, lives in macro namespace. The other one's not. But you know, depending on like a variety of factors, you like need to think of like, okay, which one should I use? Do I want to use types like race all, try race all, try join all, race, bang, join? You know, you, if, if you look at the whole matrix, it becomes like a lot. So um yeah, it, it applies to like all the other concurrency adapters too. So I set out to be like, well, can we unify this? I've been thinking about this for like a couple of years now, for a couple of blog posts. Um, I came up with an experiment. Uh, it's called Futures Concurrency. It's a library. Uh, you can you can use it <laughs> today. It's it's not super. It has like eight commits, so don't don't expect too much. Yeah, but. Um, I, I just want to show like the direction that we could be taking things, or you know, I'm I'm currently taking things. So two way join um, with you know we, we saw it like this a dot join b, but using uh, futures concurrency and using the traits defined there, we can uh, use a comma b dot join. And if you join that, then the output type uh, becomes ten comma eleven. If you want to have a three way join, all you do is you define a new future a comma b comma c comma like dot join and then you get back 10 11 12 and you can sort of like keep expanding on this right so you know if we have 15 futures we get to like you know just join all of them like manually if we want to and and that will just work um not just tuples also also arrays by the way uh which is kind of nice and so for like um non-const types for like types um whose size we don't know like during comp compile time. So like using vex of futures, for example, rather than doing join all, rewrite it to um, then just be like a vec, a vec a, b, and we just call dot join on the vec, and we get a new vec back of the result futures, which, which is quite nice. So 
Uh, yeah, <laughs> that that's that's sort of like where we're at in terms of design. Um, you can use this with tuples. You can use this with vex. You can use this with um, regular arrays as well. Um, and you know they'll they'll just work. The the nice thing here is you have a container type. You put all the features in there, and then you suffix it with your um, your mode of concurrency, whether it's join, raise, join all, etc. Right. That that's the idea. Um, you have your futures. You join it or you, you use method of concurrency and you get your values back out in the same shape that they went in. So the, the translation hopefully becomes like very fluid. Um, so that's the theory. Uh, implementation, yay. Okay, so it's very short. So what do we have today, right? Futures concurrency, uh, the join trade looks like this. It is a single method that returns a future. There's not much going on, not much magic. And it's implemented manually for um, a whole bunch of like tuples for VEC and for array. Um, so that's not much done. Um, we don't have any of the other methods quite implemented yet, right? Um, and you know, like some some stuff that we still still like need to figure out is like, uh, is this the right trait? Uh, how can we like move this trait into standard lib? Um, there's some. I have a working theory that we can like move it in there today, but we need to seal it and like you know lock it down so we are like future compatible. But uh, yeah, and there, there's like legit questions also like how to introduce try join. There's some like fun considerations of like try join should be on the same method as like join as a join trait, but we can't express that today. So how do we do that? You know, there, there's stuff to figure out. So experiments left to do. But if you want to use this mode of concurrency today, uh, it is fully implemented, like in async std. So you know, all the try join, try race, all these things, they they do exist, albeit like flagged. Um, yeah. So uh, Act Four, uh, merging streams, and this is new content. Um, what I mean by that is I published a blog post last week covering most of the stuff up until now. Um, but this is a unreleased blog post and essentially all the stuff that I had to cut from the previous blog post that has become its own blog post. So, um, if you didn't read that, then this will likely be new. Anyway, that, that was a lot of words to like me have a sip of water as well. Um, <laughs> so, um, all right. Uh, merging streams. So, oh, oh. Interesting. I forgot what example this is. So I'll just talk it through. <laughs> what we're doing here is we define a future of one. We give it like of a value one. Again, you can replace it with like do a do a file system call or like get something from a channel, stuff like that. We're to officially add a add a delay of one second. So it'll resolve after one second, right? Second future also with a delay of two seconds, third future, delay of three seconds. So we know. A results before B results before C, right? So here we uh, create a little array. We call dot race on it, and then we call await, and then we get one back. So the problem that we're like trying to, to resolve, or the the problem that we're trying to cover here, is like, um, what if we want to do two things, right? Like get uh, futures back as soon as they're available, right? So we want to have the value of one, like available to us as soon as it like resolves. But rather than like discarding uh, future B and C, right, which, which we currently do, race does that, um, we eventually also want to get the values of B and C because we care about those. But we, we want to start acting as soon as A is ready, right? So ra race is not the right way to do that. So um, yeah, <laughs> well, how, how can we do this? So lo looking at the past, um, the futures of REST library uh, says that we can use the select macro for this. So um, the way this works is, and I, I, I took this example from the async book, which is officially part of the Rust org. Right, and it says like, "Hey, th th this is the hello world of how to do stuff with like select." So you know, not not trying to like, create any any specific examples, but I, I think this is like pretty representative, right? So th this is the the basic example which creates a counter that sums up a bunch of like things, uh, numbers, like go going through it line by line. Uh, 
we import futures stream and stream X. We import the select macro from the futures lib. Um, we create an iterator that gives us, or like a stream, right? From an iterator, which uh, yields the numbers one, two, and three. Then we create a, oh, and we call fuse on it, which is important. I like what fuse does is um, it says that once this stream has uh, yielded none once, it will forever continue to yield none rather than say panic, <laughs> which is valid behavior. So we fuse it and then we have stream B and we like make it return like a, a VEC of like four, five, six. We fuse that and then we initialize our counter and we initialize it to zero, right? We create a big loop because we want to loop over the streams. Uh, within it, we now start to use the select macro. Uh, the select macro will return like an item of a type um, so here, um, we say we assign item to a.next. So whenever, uh, a.next resolves something, we create a variable called item and we return that from the block. Same for like B, you know, that also returns item. And here's like a special select keyword called complete and it says when complete, when all the streams have been exhausted, um, break. So that breaks the outer loop, right? And then we match on item and we say, hey, if this is sum, get the number contained within like the option and add it to our total. And finally, we assert that our total is 21. So again, putting it all together, we, we have like the various parts and that's hello world for using select. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, async stud stream merge. That is a different way of doing something very similar. And I'll show you how here. So um, you import the async prelude, you import async stream, and then you know we're, we're gonna create the two streams again, right? Stream A and stream B. Um, however, we don't need to fuse them. That, that's like one very nice like aspect of this, right? No fusing going on, you just have two streams. Then we initialize our counter like we did, and we call a.merge B which creates a stream of like a shared stream from two streams. It says, as soon as a value is available from like either, you know, uh, give me that value. So in, in this case, and we'll do some like ra random stuff in there, but it essentially it merges multiple streams into a single stream, not like zip, which creates tuples, I believe, or like chain, which uh, exhausts one and then the other. No, it says like, whenever there's data, I'll take that data. It's all async, so stuff resolves at different times, right? So a dot merge b creates one, one one stream here, and then we say for each number, uh, we add that number to total. We await that, and then we assert that our total is twenty one. And then we can, you know, because we're doing stuff with numbers here, you probably you you may know this from like the iterator uh, async std stream like follows all the iterator adapters and stuff. We can instead call a dot merge b dot sum, so we don't like initialize a total number, but we just say like sum all the numbers and then we get back a total. And then, you know, we can even inline that. And then we truly have like reduced that whole like logic into a one liner. That's not unreasonable, I'd say, right? So um, one thing that um, like the select blocks like says it's like really good for or like attempts to also like do is like not just like handle streams, but also handle uh, resolving futures. So you can put like a stream in there, but you can also just directly give it futures. Uh, and th when those resolve, you can like select over those. So um, let's take a look at how that looks using stream merge. Oh yeah. So the, the there there will be like roughly three steps. Um, First, we convert our futures into streams. So um, here we have three futures, or are like, uh, sorry, A, A is an array of values, which will become a stream. B is an array of strings, stirs, like static stirs. Uh, convert that into a stream because multiple values. And then C is a future, which is also of type like stir, right? So stream from iter, stream from iter, and stream once. Stream once takes um, a single future and converts it into a stream, right? And then we have A, B, and C, and now all three are streams. We we normalize the futures into streams first. Second step is map the streams to an enum. So what we want to do is we want to convert all of the different types into a single type. And the way uh, Rust does like, um, what do you call them, set types, is using enums. We define an enum. So here we say enum message 
which either has a num or text, right? And then here in our stream, we say, hey, all the ones that are like numbers, uh, dot map them into numbers. All the ones which are text, dot map them into text, right? Now they're all of the same type. And now that they're all of the same type, we can call merge on them, right? So here we go, a.merge b.merge c. This now works, which gives us back our stream. And then we iterate over the stream. We get a message out because it's an enum and we want to get the values out. We match on it. Then we say num, uh, we print it. Then we say text and we print that. And now we have like it all together. We have like a variety of input types and we merge them all into the same stream. Variety of like, you know, it's, stream, it's uh, streams combined with futures combined with like different types. And they all like get flattened into like a single loop. And rather than having like a select block with like custom syntax and semantics and stuff like continue or what was it uh, on break? Yeah, for, uh, I, I forget what the keyword was, but it, it just becomes back into, into a match statement, which is kind of nice, right? So um, shiny future. This is the last little part. Um, this is the last little part. It's all. It's what. What? Oh, we're almost there. We're almost there. All right. So sort of like taking, put, putting our little like hats on and being like, oh, what what could stuff look like in the future if we had like a bunch of like language features, right? So uh, warning. This is all made up. None of this lives in RFCs. All of this lives in my brain. So what you're seeing here is not real. Don't expect it to become real. But it's fun to think about, and I think it's also like fun to sort of like set a dot on the horizon of like where could we go, right? Like what would be better? How could things look like? Because that helps us like design things as well, right? Uh, so this is my grandiose design. Um, there's a lot going on here. Let, let me break it down. So uh, first off, uh, whoa, whoa. Uh, yeah, yeah, we have, our, we have our three part. Oh, wait, hold on. Oh, did I add the wrong? Yeah, I did the wrong, sorry. <laughs> there, there's like three parts about this, right? We have the enum message part where we define our enum. Then we have our center. I added those arrows wrong. Yeah, then we have like our center little part where we're like mapping values into like stuff. And then we have our final part where we're like looping over things. Right. So first off, async iteration. Right. So async iteration currently doesn't exist. We have like while at some await loops. Uh, instead, one could conceive we could have like four await message in Sorry, on like four uh, X and Y loops, we would have four await X and Y loops, right? So that's something that we could get into the language, most likely. Async overloading is a fun one. I wrote a blog post on this, maybe. Um, the idea is that just like Swift, uh, async has async overloading built in. Um, maybe we could have it. So rather than like having separate traits for like um, iter and async iter, right? Or iter and stream the way it is like today today um we could detect like uh is this running like an async block are you calling this an async block if so convert this into an async method right so here we see um our thing we call into iter and that just works because it's like an async version of that trait um finally the merge trait what if uh stream merge had its own like traits and it was like part of the top level like imports and scope Right, we could do the same thing that we were doing earlier, which is be like, oh, you just have like um, an array of um, separate like streams, and you call dot merge on them, or a vec, or a tuple. Uh, yeah, maybe not a tuple, but the other two, yes. Uh, right. Then async IO in standard lib, like what if print line, you know, actually didn't like block, but would like be async, requires an executor, runtime, all this stuff, right? Inline print args, I believe it's coming in REST 2021, which is a couple weeks out, but you'll just be able to do this. So you don't need to like have separate comma and then param, but you can just inline the param, which is nice. Uh, match shorthand is another fun one. What if we could like, rather than like indenting the match statement in a separate block, we could lift it out to the top, like, so it becomes like a one liner with the four weight. Maybe that's nice, right? So yeah. That's all like very shiny future. Maybe maybe we can make these things happen. I, I think it could be fun to like get some of this stuff in, right? So act five, looking ahead. Uh, yeah. So what's next um, for this whole proposal? <laughs> I'm sure it was like quite quite a bit to take in. Um, 
But yeah, I'm going to release a third blog post in a series of async concurrency blog posts or futures concurrency blog posts. Um, I'll be covering what we covered in the second part, which is the select blocks and stream merge and stuff, right? I need to put it into writing so I can share it with like the rest of the working group. Um, so yeah, that's in progress right now. Uh, we need to implement try join. Uh, I think I mentioned that earlier as well. There's like, we, we don't have the try join methods and try race. Um, in in like the the futures concurrency library yet, um, then that will have some fun design complications implications that we may want to address at a language level as well. So it will be a fourth blog post, and after that we'll probably need some time to digest all of this and figure it out, talk to folks, see how people feel if, like stuff works, and if all that goes well, we can start writing RFCs to actually start adding these things to the standard loop. Yeah. Anyway. That's the timeline there. Uh, that's it also for my talk. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um